From my recent used Enterprise hardware on eBay collection, we've gotten this. This is labeled as a Sun F40, or there's Oracle branding on it too, because they got bought up into the same company now. And what it is, is it's a um, LSI warp drive. And the warp drives are some of the early PCIe drives. And why I got this one over a lot of other ones, like the Fusion IO ones, is that these have very good OS compatibility compared to almost every other early PCI Express drive. Because, see, before NVMe came out, there was a lot of different standards for how to do PCI Express storage. And LSI, having a lot of technology with their um, HBA cards, essentially just slapped four SAS SSDs on here with their HBA and a connector here. So it's basically just four SAS SSDs together. Here's a 400 gig model. Get them for about 60 to 70 bucks on eBay. And that's what they are. And you can see on the back, they're pretty simple. Um, ton of SSDs on it. They're, they come in multiple capacities. The Sun F41 is generally cheaper just because it's the Sun name and less people know about it. But it's the same thing as the LSI warp drives. They also come in a 200 gigabyte SLC one, though that one's pretty darn expensive because it's SLC. Um, and you get these up to about 3.2 terabytes, generally at around 20 to 30 cents a gig, depending on the capacity. Um, under these are just um, SSDs, so under these heat sinks here are just um, SSDs, those eight, I think, 16 gigabyte Toshiba NAND chips, and a Sandforce controller because LSI bought up Sandforce. And then under this heat sink is a um, LSI um, SAS HBA. So, and then we have some large capacitors here which do power loss protection. And some people have some tweaks that basically tell Linux that I have power loss protection, so you don't have to worry about doing that. And that I have a larger, I think these have an a 8K block size, so just work with that. And a few other little tweaks, but even without them, they perform fine. Um, not much else, they're Enterprise MLC drives, so they have quite a bit of endurance. These came with about 70 terabytes of write per drive, so that's quite a bit compared to most other used SSDs I've came across. But they should still be able to handle quite a bit more. None of them have had problems yet in my little bit of testing. One other problem you might see is these only come with the short brackets because they're probably designed for um, the Sun service. So one solution is you can just find a bracket. They use the same bracket as any of the other LSI um, HBAs and just plop that bracket on there and you get a full size bracket. So one option you might think is, well, is this drive bootable? And the answer is yes, yeah, surprisingly. Unlike a lot of these other ones, due to their driver systems, it is bootable. So if I go under hard drive boot properties, you can see these 0400 LUN 080. That's the drive, and there's four of them. They don't go in any RAID. So if you want to do something, you can put the boot manager on one and maybe clone it to a second one for good measure. And then the, um, for like 128 megs of the drive, and then the rest of it is a giant RAID 0 volume and something like MDA and or BTRFS and Linux. So now, let's go and reboot this system into Windows and see what Windows looks like. So as I said before, since this is an HBA and not a RAID card, it shows up as four drives. And it also means you get this screen when booting. Um, so it says Seagate on it, because Seagate bought up the, um, the SSD part of LSI. So I can actually hit Control c um, and it enters a configuration utility, which I've never actually had to do before. And it should take a minute or two, and basically it says there's an adapter, alt, I have the worst keystrokes here, alt in. Um, there's like a pause boot. Uh, there's not much to say. Life LED, um, boot support. So yeah, you can turn boot support on or off, I don't see a reason to turn it off. It shows SAS, which is fine. There's really not much you can say. It says the um, status and life LED are all green, which I guess is good. And then there's an access LED that flashes every time you use it. So I guess we're just going to exit. I'm going to discard changes because there's nothing I need to touch. And there's nothing you really can touch. Because since it's an HBA and not a RAID card, you can't do things like make a RAID array, which would be nice, I think, in order to just make a simple RAID array on that chip, because I think the chip actually supports it, and do things like a simple volume for OSs that don't support it. But why would having this be useful if it's just a ton of SATA drives instead of having it? And I think the big answer, other than price, because generally, 
this drive is a lot cheaper than four enterprise gra grade 100 gig drives, especially since these are pretty good endurance drives, is that it takes up a lot less space. This is about the same size as any other as any other HBA in your system and it comes with drives. They actually have other models that let you plug in hard drives too, and that's kind of neat. So now let's look into Windows. So we're booting into Windows. Windows shows this as four um, SSDs. And it'll show smart data for all of them. Smart data is fully supported, which is great because a lot of these other um, old enterprise drives don't support smart. And I feel smart's just a nice to know thing. So if I run um, disk management on here, the one thing you're gonna see very quickly once it loads is that I made a RAID 0 volume here using disk management. And that's probably what I'd suggest doing if you had one of these in Windows. If you really cared about redundancy and backups, you should probably just be backing up the whole drive to something else. Yeah, you could run RAID 5, but you're losing a good amount of performance, and I'd argue it's not really worth it. So, here's one interesting thing I'd say you can look at. is something like Crystal Disk Info. Is we're going to go run this here, and I can run a pile of benchmarks, but you get pretty much the same results on all of them. Is I've done screenshots before. So, uh, okay. Um, so, here's a look at the speeds. So, here's it in Disk Management RAID. We can tell reads a lot faster than writes, which is true for especially a lot of older enterprise drives. Random I.O. is pretty darn good. Sequential is almost two gigabytes a second. I saw in Linux over 2.1, which isn't bad. Here's a single drive. Writes seem to be pretty slow in Linux. I wouldn't be surprised if it's due to making it sync or something like that. I don't know, that feels odd. And read speeds, and you can see the random IOs really aren't that much better, especially just 4K T1, um, single threaded, single Q depth. And then here's storage spaces. Uh, storage spaces does a lot worse due to how it spreads out the data, I think, into larger chunks, and it's just generally worse. Though in storage spaces, this should be a pretty darn good, cheap, fast tier drive, because it likes to have redundancy for your fast tier drive, and it's cheap, and it plugs in. And it will give you a pretty simple fast tier drive. And we can see running it again what type of performance we get. One thing that you might, it's interesting about SSDs is write testing. So a lot of consumer grade SSDs you get today have a write cache, which basically means that after X period of time, once the write cache fills up, they will get much slower. I haven't tried this test yet on these drives, but I'm guessing they don't have an SLC write cache just due to the fact that they're enterprise drives and often enterprise drives don't. And MLC drives really don't need a write cache because MLC is quite a bit better than TLC normally when it comes to write speeds. And here we can see the full write test and we see it's pretty much the same, which means there's no write caching, which is great for write intensive SSD, which mm, I'm probably gonna be using it for that. So that's always nice. Um, read speed should be about the same on these two with basically nothing. The other thing, looking at health on all of these drives, they're all pretty good, but I'd say Crystal Disk Mark does a better job at showing health on drives. So let's take a look at Crystal Disk Info. I mean. um, every drive seems to show the amount of writes in a different format, which is dumb. Um, so here it goes. Yeah, the other thing you have to remember is these things run incredibly toasty, so you pretty much need a fan on them. Um, 36,000 hours they've been used. Total writes is 76 terabytes. And you can't, these are hex, but if you saw these in decimal, it would show as a, um, the number. So each, the, for the um, lifetime writes from host, that is the writes in um, gigabytes. So a few more interesting experiments I've ran on this drive. So this is a PCIe 2.0 X8 drive. So how much bandwidth does it actually use? Because you can get a little over 2,000 gigabytes per second, that is actually faster than it can get. So for example here, um, I have on displayed on the left here, I have a crystal disk mark um, of it on a PCI 2 X4 link, and on the right, it's on a X8 link. So yeah, it helps a, a reasonable bit with the sequential reads, but the right's pretty much the same, actually slightly better, which is probably just an anomaly. And if it basically, if it doesn't hit, if it's not over like this 1500 number, it doesn't make a difference. So there's one other interesting note. The other note is they have software for this called DDCLI, which lets you do some new management. 
and it blah 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 lets you do some stuff it lets you do a um let you show the info it lets you show health which is different than the smart data it says 100% health i've never seen anyone post anything that says it's under 100% health um you can show smart logs for all of them if you want so if i can do test.txt and it's gonna take a sec. The one interesting thing you can do in here, which I don't think you could do anywhere else, is change the provisioning amount. Not a ton of drives let you do this, probably just because you shouldn't. Um, and now, these are 74 or 80 gig drives. And I'm curious what it shows at boot up. So if I do a restart, it shows the drives at boot up. And it probably went and nudged a firmware on these drives to say, hey, you're a smaller drive now, and firmware you can use more. Because essentially, these drives have 128 gigabytes of flash on it. For a consumer drive, this would be either 128 or 120 gigs, gigabytes usable. Where well, there's an enterprise drive, so you get 100 gigs usable. Which basically means if you're doing a lot of writes, there's more space for it to use for other provisioning, which means it can more efficiently deal with writes. And as we see here, it shows there are 74 gig drives. Um, so it does work between reboots, and that's the only way I think you can show it. Um, but essentially, it over-provisions it more, and due to how the writes work, if you're writing in one area, that means it has to move less data around to work well with the over-provisioning. And I think you can, I think that's the max over-provisioning, making it an 80 gig drive, which means it's almost half the actual NAND capacity. I'm gonna just run it as 100 gig because I like the extra space a little bit more than that and I'm not gonna be pounding it with writes. If I was using it as something like an S-log, I probably would. I don't know if this supports trim. I think it does though. Let's look. So now we can see it does show up as an 80 gig drive and it does also support trim. So I probably wouldn't ever do this as someone maybe correct me, but if you, you can just put an 80 gig partition, trim the rest of the space, and it's essentially the same as having the um, doing it in software, and that's probably what it's doing, just telling it the max size. And I can go back to PowerShell and play with a few more settings, and it'll be a big drive again. So that was the um, performance over provisioning, and performance-wise, it should only affect writes, but let's be curious and actually give it a write benchmark now. Another interesting observation, if you look at CPU usage, you notice that there's very high usage on the first core, which tells me there's something about how it manages it. Well, I think often low-level system processes put a ton of load on one core. Now, um, so one other thing to look at is let's compare these speeds to other ones. I'm most worried probably about sequential and random writes because it shouldn't affect the read speeds very much. So this here is a screenshot of just doing it as I got it out of the box, which is probably its normal setting. Uh, read speeds are pretty much within margin of error. Write speeds slightly higher. Not much, slightly lower for this 4K high QDAP, slightly higher for this sequential single-threaded, and we'll find out what 4K single QDAP does now. So those are some pretty darn mixed numbers, so really it isn't a big improvement. Now you will probably start seeing a big improvement if you don't have trim and doing a ton of writes in one area especially. But I probably won't be doing that, and you can easily change it later on. Let's try the one other option, which is formatting it with the um, most space. So we're going to format all of them. Yes, we want to mess with over-provisioning, and then we want to do max capacity. And yes, it will delete all the data, and the system might complain. And it says uh, selected over-provisioning is not supported. So it gives you an option which it doesn't support. Okay, that's annoying, but so I guess we're just going to format it as the um as the nominal one which gives you 100 gigs so that's fine not a huge difference realistically fine unless you're doing a very write heavy workload if you're using it for something like an s log and zfs or a write cache that's what i'd probably do but yeah these are fine they also handle quite a bit of endurance next thing smart logs okay you can export them you get two bin files, which are probably designed to be worked on by something. I don't know what. For this one, it gives you mostly zeros. There's like a one here. I don't know. It doesn't tell you what any of these event logs are. The other one is a binary file, which I can't think of anything useful about. So, not much to talk about. It drives back to being a 100 gigs. 
So the one other thing that might be, um, that it might have let you do on some other models is over provision it to a 120 gig drive. But because it looks like um, having a 128 gigabyte drive that you over provision to 100 is very common in the enterprise world. 80 is just even more. 100 is going to be fine for almost everyone. So there's a few more interesting characteristics of these drives. I might do a follow up later on with a more intensive workload once I start hitting this thing pretty hard in the server and see if it holds up well and see how much writes it can really handle. But for now, thanks for watching and say subscribe for the possible follow up of this video.